Um, but it was in 1992 that the film A Few Good Men came out. Uh, that was a year after I was born. And, uh, and so just pointing that out. Um, but, uh, but so I have actually never watched the full film. But there is a line from that film that is famous and quoted. Carrie, shout it out. There we go. There we go. Carrie, all the way from the back. You can't handle the truth. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about truth this morning. We're going to talk about truth and we're going to talk about love. And uh, the Apostle John um, really focuses in on, uh, on the idea of truth and what truth is and what we're to do with the truth. And so um, we're going we're gonna to really focus in on that this morning, read through Second John, um, but we're also going to kind of set a baseline in a few other areas of the Bible. And so in the Gospel of John, not Second John, but the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 37 to 38, it says, You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth, said Pilate. What is truth? This is a, this is a question we've been asking, our society asks all the time. In fact, if you Google what is truth, you'll most likely be directed to Stanford University and, and, and uh, you know, Harvard and their philosophy departments breaking down what really learned minds have, have defined truth to be. But, but what I did is I kind of scrolled through those pages. I didn't read it all. I'm just going to tell you right now because that was a lot of reading. Um, but but as, I was, as I was scrolling, what I noticed is there was more questions than answers in talking about truth. That, that there was a ton of, of questions about what is truth. And, and, and in 1992, when Jack Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth, I think that if we were to re-translate uh, re, uh, that to today's society, to our lives in 2022, that it would probably be phrased, you can't handle my truth. That truth has been become something that is individualized and and uh, put into a box, and this is my truth. And hey, I'm glad that you have your truth, and and I have my truth, and they have their truth, and we'll all just live in our own circles of truth. And as long as you're happy, then I'm happy, and as long as I'm happy, then you should be happy. And and don't worry about it. So, what is truth? Is it something that's individual? Is it something that that needs to be fleshed out? Is there a golden standard of truth? I think uh, it's a really big general question, the question, what is truth? But I think when, when the rubber meets the road of this question is when we have to decide, what's the truth for my life? What's, what's the truth about, about my purpose? What, is, there, is there a destiny laid out for me? Is there a, a path laid out for me? Is there someone helping direct my steps? Or is it just that every step I take is completely up to me to make the most of it and do the best with it? What is, what is truth when we're raising our kids? And, and what is truth about what is right and what is wrong? What is truth about, about what, wh how you should parent? Because there's a million and one parenting strategies out there right now. Believe me, as, as Danae and I have announced we're pregnant and those kind of things. Like, there's so many different opinions. Hey, you should try this or you should do that. And this is the schooling you should look at. And this is the schooling you should look at. And, and so this, this, overwhelming da database of opinion comes at you. What is truth when we're raising our kids? Should they, should they be allowed to swear? Believe, believe it or not, this is a, a, a big question um, that is talked about a lot. In fact, um, one, of, one of the more famous influencers right now, his name is Gary V. Um, he's, he's a fairly, fairly uh, 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 successful man and, and all that. He, he believes that you should allow your kids to swear and it's the teacher's problem if they have a problem with it because it's just a more, it's a more uh, uh, 
uh, truthful way to communicate is the way is the way he he puts it. And so, and, right. So, so, so some some of you are going, how is this even a conversation right now? But there are schools of thought around that. And I'm hearing it more and more and more. And so we're going to have to learn to double down on what is truth, that that the words that we speak have meaning, that that when we're trying to honor somebody, we need to be meaningful. That respect is a good thing. Right? These are biblical principles that we have built into our kids, built into our lives, done our best with. But we are going to have to understand that there is a standard of truth. And what I want to talk about is who the truth is. That the truth is not a concept. It's a person. So we need to determine the truth. John chap- chapter 14, again, in the Gospel of John. We're not quite to Second John yet, but John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Truth is not a concept, it's a person. Truth is not a concept, it's a person. Have you ever uh, been in an escape room before? Have you guys ever done those escape rooms that were really po- popular before COVID? And now I think they've kind of died out a little bit. I think there's still a few kicking, but um, they had a really rough go with the whole the whole uh, uh, COVID years there. And so um, I've done escape rooms a few times, and um, I remember uh, going with a group of friends and and trying to figure these things out. And and so I've been in one that was like a, a Hansel and Gretel themed one, and I've been in one that was like in a in a, a, a bunker like a nuclear bunker i've been in um, a few different ones and uh, and so the idea is that you're trying to to unlock these puzzles that you're trying to figure out how to get out of this room and so there's a series of keys that need to be found of combinations that need to be found of clues that need to be put together to be able to put those combinations together and to do those things and so you go in with your friends and you either come out friends still or you leave not talking to anybody because someone took over and led you down the wrong way but I was in this room with with uh with our friends and and we were going through it and we we found what we thought was the truth making sense of 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 everything we could until all of a sudden we got stuck and so you only have an hour to get through this room. And so we're watching time tick down. We're watching time tick down. We're trying to figure out what the answer is. And we're going over all the numbers we've collected. We're going over all the, all the clues we've had. We're, we're going over every piece of the puzzle that we have put together. And we're going, this all makes sense. Why can't we get through this last lock there? We have three numbers that aren't used yet. Like this has got to be the combination. We tried all, all the combinations possible. We can't seem to get through this combination lock. What is going on? And then at the end of the, the end of the, the time in the, in the escape room, the host comes in, shows us that we had missed a key and hadn't found a lock. And so if we had just found that key, if we had just, if we had just found that lock, if we, had, if we hadn't missed out on those tiny little details, then we would have been able to escape the room within the time provided that we were, we were doing really good, but then we got stuck because we missed something. And so um, I think that when, when, we try and, and, um, when we try and put together our own truth, when we try and figure out what truth is on our own, a lot of times we'll find a bit of a way that makes sense, but then we get stuck. And we can't figure out, oh, this is working. Why is this not working anymore? Why am I struggling? Why, why am I still, you know, why, why is what was truth for me before now not seeming to be true today? Why, why can I not seem to, to make this thing work? And it's because the essence of an escape room is not, is not, it's not figuring out how to escape. It's figuring out how to think like the person who set up the room. And so truth Finding truth in this life is like going through an escape room. You can find pieces that help you get along. You can find ways to help you get along. You can find all of these things that help you get along. But at some point, you don't think like the creator 
this world, like the creator of you, like the creator of everything. You don't think like him. And so at some point, we're going to get stuck unless we learn to go back to who he is. And so the truth is a person. This world is made by God. He spoke it into existence. And in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I don't know about you, but me trying to tell God how things works never seems to work too well in my favor. Me trying to tell God, hey, this is how this needs to go, it never seems to work in my favor. I just, I just believe, church, if I can just be honest, I just believe we're all busy playing checkers and God is playing chess. Like he, he knows all the moves. He is that much more complex. He's that much more complicated. He's that much more, more in depth in the way he created things. Look at the way we were created. Look at the way our world functions in and of itself. Even if you just look at nature in and of itself and it's the way it works in, in congruence with, with one another, the way thing he is intricate. He is, he has paid attention to details. He is into everything and so when we try and figure out truth on our own it's like having a surface level understanding of the creator of the universe if we want to have an understanding of truth we have to go back to the person who is jesus who will reveal truth to us who has given us truth in his word who has given us truth in the bible to be able to go back to and figure things out and so finally let's go to let's go to second john we're going to talk about practicing the truth. Second John verse 1 says, The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that remains in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth in keeping, in keeping with the command that we have received from the Father. So now I ask you, dear lady, not as if we were writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commands. The, this is the command as you have heard it from the beginning, that you walk in love. And so, so John says here that I love you in truth. I love you in truth. And this isn't just, this isn't him just saying like, I truly love you. He's saying, I love you in truth. As truth being a standard, as truth being a platform, as truth being something that can be built off of, something that can be engaged with, something that can be, can be used to unite and so he says, I love you in truth. And what he's saying is, I love you in Jesus. I love you in who our Savior is. I love you as a sister in Christ. I love you in the truth of who Jesus is. And if we don't have that truth, then that love has nothing to stand on. I love you in truth. Truth and love, they, they need each other. What we need to understand is that our truth Jesus, our truth doesn't die because Jesus lives forever. And so if our standard of truth is Jesus, it doesn't change when life changes. It doesn't change when things don't go our way. It doesn't change when we struggle. It doesn't change when everything's all good. Or if our standard of truth is Jesus, then Jesus remains the truth throughout life and all the ebbs and flows of it. But truth and love need each other. I've heard it said that truth without love is cruelty and love without truth is useless. That truth without love is cruelty, but love without truth is useless. We, I think, as, as a church, as people, have been bad communicators of the truth. Because I think love, 
without truth is easy, right? We've seen so many different ministries out there where we're just loving on people and loving on people and loving on people and loving on people. But we go, where, where's the fruit starting to come in? Because there hasn't been that truth married with love. We have to love people in the truth of Jesus and speak truth in that love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3 says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. Goes on to talk about it a little bit more, but it's literally like if I grabbed one of the drumsticks right now, and I won't because I don't want to hurt people's ears, but if I grabbed one of the drumsticks right now, and I just started crashing on the cymbal, and so I was trying to talk to you, but I'm just crashing on the cymbal, and I'm just crashing away and crashing away and crashing away, and I'm trying to talk to you. Are you hearing a word that I'm saying? No. You're hearing the clanging of the symbol. And so I could be saying the best thing you've ever heard. I could be saying the most important thing you've ever heard. But if I'm banging on a symbol because I have no love, if I'm banging on the symbol because, because I'm just looking to get it out there and, and speak the truth and not care what you think and say, hey, it's your job where it lands. I'm just banging on the symbol and banging on the symbol and banging on the symbol. You don't leave feeling full of life. You don't leave feeling full of truth. You don't leave feeling full of of what God has asked us to do, which is to love people in truth. I think the truth without love just kind of makes us annoying. When we look at, at Jesus, he loved people deeply. He loved people deeply, but he wasn't afraid of the truth. John, um, John 14, 21 says, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. And so this is, this is a little bit circular that our, our, our command is, is to love and, and to love is, is the command. It, 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 it kind of circulates in that last verse of second John. And then it, it it, it circulates kind of again here in John 14, 21. But our, our idea here is that Jesus is the standard. That's, that's, what, that's what John is trying to get across to, to this woman. And so he's writing, 2 John is, is John writing to this woman who's leading a house church. She's leading this house church and, and, and he's, he's saying, hey, I love you in truth. I love you in the name of Jesus. I love you on the standard that we have in common, which is Jesus. I love your, your congregation and your gathering. I love what you're doing. But truth is important. And so then we get into protecting the truth. And so in John, 2 John 7 to 11, it says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and do not greet him. For the one who greets him shares in his evil works. And so John goes in and starts, starts, you know, off this book by saying, Hey, I love you in truth. And I'm excited and, and things are going good. And, and that's awesome. And I remind you just love one another in truth, love one another, uh, together. It's a command by Jesus. It's our command to, to love one another and, and to love Jesus. And if we, if we love Jesus, then we'll follow his commands and his command is to love. And so continue to love. And, and so he, 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 communicates this complex subject and, and kind of creates this circular pattern of, okay, well, if you want to be in truth, then you got to love Jesus. You want to love Jesus, then you got to follow his command, but his command is to love and to, and, and so it just kind of creates this circle of what we're supposed to do as disciples of Christ, that we're supposed to love Jesus and love one another. And as we do that, we'll love Jesus more and we'll be more founded on his truth and we'll be more founded on who he is. And so we'll go through life together that way. But then he brings a warning. And no wonder this woman is, is doing her best and she's leading this house church. And 
I don't know if you've ever been to a house church, but I wouldn't say that they're um, generally administratively or or structurally very protected. They're they're often very very you know there there's a lot of benefits to house churches, and I'm not speaking against them at all. But it's often a, a lot more of an informal gathering than a church service here in in a building or or with a staff or or those kind of things and. And, uh, and so um, uh, John is writing to this woman who's leading this house church, just trying to do this amazing ministry, trying to just win people to Jesus, trying to, trying to spread the love of Jesus out of her home and, and, and do this amazing ministry in a place where she would have been marginalized in many ways, I'm sure. And, and, and you know, there, there would have been many challenges for a woman leading a, a house church. And so he writes her and he says, hey, be careful who you let in. Be careful who you let speak to your congregation. That even though they're small, that even though they're, they're, you're, you're just kind of you're just kind of going and, and, and being informal, be careful who you let in. If they're not standing on the truth of Jesus, if they're adding to him or taking away from him, don't let them in. You have to protect the truth. You have to protect who this truth is. You have to protect who Jesus is to your congregation. And we have to be careful not to let in the wrong things, let in wrong teaching, let in uh, wrong ideas about God. And so here's, here's what I want us to understand, though. Whenever we see a warning in the New Testament, nine times out of ten, and pretty close, honestly, to 10 times out of 10. Whenever there's a warning against, against something wrong going, in a church, going on in a church or, or uh, Jesus was giving a warning or anything, it was against those who believed, at least a portion, like the church does, but that had taken a step further or taken a step away. In other words, it wasn't lost people that were seen as a threat in the New Testament. It was people already within the fold who went outside of who Jesus was. So it wasn't lost children or lost sheep that were the threat. It was friendly fire. And so this is where we find ourselves in this, in this book where John is warning against those that are not remaining in Christ's teaching, but are going beyond it. And he goes as far as to say they don't have God. But I think when we're talking about this conversation of truth, when we're talking about what is my truth or, or what is the truth we're supposed to follow, that we as Christians sometimes have dropped the ball in understanding to mix that love and truth together in a way that actually leads to someone seeing Christ in his fullness. I think social media has done a lot of damage. I think we've we've shared little little quippy, pithy things on 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 our Facebook on our Facebook feeds and and said amen or isn't this truth or or you know put up the the emoji hands that are you know kind of like I actually found out that that's those aren't praise hands it's like a two-handed clap. And so we use it as praise hands but it's a two-handed clap. Anyways, um fun fact of the day. Uh but but I think we've, we've shared those things and we've seen our brothers and sisters sharing those kind of things. And, and we've remained silent and we haven't, we haven't called to accountability what that means. Because what we have to understand, church, is that those, who, those things that we are seeing as threats to our, to our, to our church, to our society, as, as threats to us and, and what we believe in the truth of Jesus, what we're seeing as threats if we're seeing people as threats, that's never been Jesus' attitude. That they were seen as lost sheep and lost children, but it was the Pharisees that he criticized. If you look at the, the apostles, it's in, in their letters, it's 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 critical things about people within the church. If you were to be walking through the woods on a beautiful day like today and and a lost child came out of nowhere. Walked out of the woods and, 
and and just said, I, I have no I have no clue which way, but I, I'm going this way. And you know that it's the absolute wrong way, that they're heading deeper into the trail rather than back towards where they need to go to be able to be rescued. Are you gonna are you gonna just let them go on? Are you gonna are you gonna judge them and tell them they're they're stupid for going that direction? Are you gonna tell them they're ridiculous for going that direction? Are you gonna tell them that the that you know who do they think they are to go that direction? No, you're going to take pity and go, hey, no, it's actually this way. Let me take you there. If you were to come across a lost sheep, and I know that's not a really big reality in Canada, but if you were to come across a lost sheep or a lost dog, Danae and I, when we first moved into, I think I shared this from the stage, I don't know if I did, but when we first moved into our new house, I was doing some work and we had a, we had a perimeter fence uh, of, our, of our lot and um, I was bringing things in and out and just, you know, the craziness of moving and at some point our dog Simba had, had kind of run, run down to the basement and gotten up the basement stairs and, and took off and went down to Gull Lake Park and met some people and he thought it was a great time. We uh, did not. Uh, we, we were worried sick, but we discovered he was lost, and, and our hearts were just like, oh my goodness, what, where is he? Where is he? Who has him? What is going on in, in his brain right now? Like, like we're, we're going out to look, and, and I'm going, Lord, please just don't let us come across him, you know, have, having been hit by a car, or, or Lord, I mean, we, we love him, and he's a, he's a beautiful dog, like, please don't let someone steal him, and and so we, we find, Danae finally finds him, and this guy had found him and tied an um, iPhone charger around, his, his, uh, around his, his collar loop, and it was taking him on a bike over. He thought it was his friend's dog, and we were like, no, that's ours. Um, and, uh, and Simba was just happy. Uh, but uh, but we, when we found him again, we were so happy. We were so relieved that someone had taken the time to grab him and was taking him to a place of safety. Church, we have to stop seeing people who look at life differently than us, who see things differently than us, who disagree or directly oppose what we believe as the enemy. We have an enemy, but he's a spiritual one. Our enemy is not those that are far from Jesus. There are people that we're meant to go, hey, I see how you're getting that you want to go that way. Let me show you this way. Let me show you the standard of truth. Let him reveal the truth to you. Let me be extra patient with you as we, as we stumble that way. Let me be extra graceful to you as you try and make your own way again and again. But let me help you get to where you need to go. It's in our services. It's in our midst that we have to protect the teaching. We have to protect the truth. That Jesus is the truth. That Jesus is the foundation. Because on the flip side, I think if you'll, you, you might agree with me. I don't know. Maybe not. But that's okay. We can disagree on things. But I think sometimes we've been very quiet on things about our faith that we don't agree with and we know that aren't scripturally based. Way more quiet on those things than we have on lost people things. Does that, does that make sense? That we've, we've been way more quiet on, on, on crazy, you know, prophecies and, 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 and things that have no base in scripture and, and have no proof in scripture that we've been way more lenient to let people just kind of believe what they want because they still believe in Jesus. So that's a good thing. We've been way more quiet on that than we have about the issues that we face against those who, who don't believe like we do. But if we look at the New Testament, if we look at how Jesus spent his time, if we look at what our gathering was supposed to be. The truth was something we were called to protect from friendly fire. I just, I just think, church, that in Canada, we're, we're headed in a direction where we're going to continue to see ourselves struggle 
We're going to continue to see ourselves struggle with having laws that match up with our values, with having, um, with having uh, uh, standards that match up to our values, that ha- having schools that match up to our values, having things that match up to our values in our everyday life. But can I offer you some hope? There are countries in this world where it has been illegal for a very, very long time to speak the name of Jesus. There are countries in this world where persecution happens and not just, oh, look at you, you're a Christian. Like, not our brand of persecution. Like, hey, they looked at me funny or they swore at me once or twice. I feel persecuted. No. Where you're literally in danger of losing your life for speaking the name of Jesus. And the gospel thrives under persecution. And so church, I'm not in any rush to see us decline in those standards or those kind of things. But we need to take hope, take heart in knowing that no attempt of the enemy will, will, will ever, ever ruin the church. That the church will stand that in, under persecution, the church can grow. That under persecution, the church can thrive. That under persecution, God can move. That under persecution, the Holy Spirit can come and work. And so whatever our persecution looks like, the Holy Spirit will work in our lives. Whatever our persecution look like, looks like, our lives will be built on the truth of Jesus. Whatever our, our future looks like, we will, we will have the hope of Jesus to lean on. No matter what, Jesus is our truth. We need to protect the truth. Our truth is not threatened by darkness. Our truth is light, and darkness cannot take over light. I just, I just believe, church, that we, we, we got to stop blaming the darkness for being dark. All it knows is darkness. We gotta stop blaming the darkness for being dark. We can only blame the light for not shining bright enough. We have that light. Let's not put it under. Let's not put it under a bushel. Let's not put it under a, a bowl. Let's not put it under. Let's not block it. But let's send that light out into the darkness. Let's invade that darkness and dispel it. The truth you carry, the light, the light you carry, is the light that will light up your workplace. It's the light that will light up your family when they gather. It's the light that will light up your, your, uh, your, your, you know, your friend groups and, and wherever you spend your time, your light is the light that you carry that will, will continue to, to light up wherever you go. And our calling is to light up dark places, not to judge them. Calling is to light up dark places, not to judge them. The gospel, I just believe this church and just saying this in closing We'll uh, let you get to your turkey here in a bit. I don't know if you're planning on doing that today or tomorrow, but I just believe that we got to get sold on this idea that the gospel, it's good news. It's good news. The Bible says that the gospel, that, 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 that the news about Jesus is, is good news. That gospel means good news. That means, that means it is good. It's good been good for 2,000 years. It was good enough that, that Roman centurions committed their lives to Jesus. It was good enough that, that those that worshipped many gods turned from that and worshipped one God. It's been good enough that, that entire societies have been saved under the name of Jesus. It's been good enough that the church spread like wap, rapid fire as the Holy Spirit fell. And as we read in the book of Acts, it's been good enough that, that we could, we've seen revival time and time and time again. It's been good enough that, that missionaries came to North America when things were starting to be settled and spread the good news of Jesus. And, and yes, there's a lot that, that could have been done better. And there's a lot that needs to be reconciled for, but my goodness, the gospel comes and it lights up people's lives. And so it's good enough for your coworker. It's good enough for your coworker or your family member that has everything they could ever want. And you're kind of, if we're honest, even though it says don't be jealous of your neighbor, you're kind of jealous. 
Because they got the house that you wish you could have. They've got the boat you wish you could have. They've got the truck you wish you could have. They've got everything together and it seems like everything's going good. It's good news for them. There's still darkness. Even when all the stuff you could want in the world is around you, there's still darkness and light needs to come and invade it. It's good enough. This good news is good enough for the teenager that has never heard the gospel. This gospel is good enough that it's good news for those who are far from God, for those who are getting closer, and for those who are already there. If it was good enough for you, it's good enough for everyone. There's no one that doesn't need God. And so in 2 John, we just see John writing to this house church saying be built up in this truth continue in it defend it from within your ranks defend it from being treated as flippant or or auxiliary defend it as being holy the good news that will change everyone's life let's pray God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we get to gather on this beautiful Thanksgiving Sunday and and, uh, worship you and sing songs to you and, and surrender to you. But God, we also just pray, Lord, that you would just remind us of the truth that you are good, the truth that you are love, the truth that that you are our truth, that you are the truth that we lean on, that Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. That because you came and you died on the cross for our sins, that we do have good news for everyone. So Lord God, as we head out and we have our Thanksgiving lunches, and maybe we've already had them, but but I know that I've talked to a lot of people who are having them today and, and tomorrow. And so Lord, as we have our Thanksgiving lunches, Lord, I pray for every family member and friend that will be gathering around our table. Lord God, I pray that we would be light. Pray that we would be light in that situation, that we'd be light in the darkness. God, that you would work in us and through us. And Lord, that as we come back next week and talk about, talk about your word again, Lord, that we would just stand in you as the truth. And that we would do so in love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody, for being with us on this Sunday, this Thanksgiving Sunday. So glad that you joined us. We will uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks so much. Have a great Sunday.